You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. This is a reading of a collection of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Eternal and Transient Elements, The Cosmic Past of Humanity and the Mystery of Evil. Collected Works, Volume 184, translated by Anna Mois. This is Lecture 7, given on the 20th of September, 1918. There is no need, really, to celebrate the fifth anniversary of laying the foundation stone for our building. And there is particularly no need for this among the people who have been more or less close in space to the building through those five years. These are disastrous days, and for that reason, too, one certainly has no time for special celebrations. Nor should the celebrating of anniversaries become a habit in our movement. Only a few words shall be said on the subject. The building could not be finished in the time which some people may, perhaps, have expected when they attended the foundation stone ceremony, or were involved in some way or other, perhaps in their thoughts, But that is not the essential thing. The essential thing with this building, even if it is still incomplete today, is that it actually does exist. Even if it were less complete than it is, the essential point would be that it does exist. And looking at its forms, one can see the spirit in which it is meant to exist. We have talked about its design, its nature, on a number of occasions. The fact that the building exists is something we really want to register as a fact, a fact which, in a way, is also an obligation for us. It simply is not one and the same thing if our spiritual scientific movement would have existed without this building over the last five years, or if it exists with this building. It is not the same thing, absolutely not the same thing. The building is, above all, a landmark for our movement. In a sense, it shows to people far and wide that there has to be such a movement in the world. It is also an obligation, as is evident to us from the way the outside world sees this building. The outside world would have been much less aware of the whole of our movement if the building did not exist. It simply is a fact that at the present time visible signs mean a great deal to people. Considering that a good deal of our work for the spiritual scientific movement will no doubt consist in fighting hostile movements, it has to be acknowledged that the existence of the building contributes quite a bit to the existence of powerful hostile movements. People would pay less attention to us if the building did not exist. It is, therefore, not enough to feel a degree of satisfaction that the building has come into existence. Considering this building to be our own affair, we must also have a feeling to go with this, like the South Pole belongs to the North Pole or the North Pole to the South Pole, that it is our responsibility to stand up for the anthroposophical cause in the right way. I'd like to say that we should not really feel pleasure or satisfaction with regard to the building, unless we are at the same time doing some, everything in our power to stand up for the anthroposophical cause. For the building would cause the destruction of our cause if sufficient strength could not be found to defend it. I would say that if we did not have a building, we could have the luxury of merely belonging to the anthroposophical cause, for there would be no visible sign which attracts the attention also of people who need visible signs. But if we take pleasure in the building, if we feel satisfaction about it, we must also accept a certain obligation to stand up for the cause of anthroposophy. The most serious misunderstandings are, of course, connected with the anthroposophical cause itself. But we shall also hear of countless misunderstandings of the worst kind where the building is concerned. You only have to meet someone new and then, excuse me, you only have to meet someone now and then who has visited the building or talks about it, and you'll see what misunderstandings there are. Many other things also show us how something positive affects people 
and our building is something positive. We won't get very far by seeking to correct ill-intentioned attacks in a negative way. But we'll go a long way if we endeavor to present the positive to the world in the right light. People who have been to the building, the evidence for this exists, and who have let it speak to them have seen something positive, and they, or at least many of them, have not formed a bad opinion of the cause that is connected with the building. We just have to be careful not to attach all kinds of mysticisms to the building when people come to visit it. The building will have its own effect if we objectively interpret it as the artistic reflection of basic spiritual scientific facts and basic observations. It will definitely compromise the building and the whole of our cause if you seek to impose all kinds of mystical things on people. My intention has been to speak of some such practical things. The most important thing is that we remember the laying of the foundation stone five years ago. The significance of this building which is intended to stand before us in liveliest sentience of the inmost nature of the anthroposophical cause. We have frequently uttered thoughts on the building and will also do so on all kinds of occasions in future. Today we take the thoughts that come to us when we look back on the occasion five years ago when we laid the foundation stone and make them part of the feeling that connects us with the building. I have often spoken to you of how the human soul is changed in the course of human evolution, how short-sighted it is to think that today's state of soul can be understood if we do not look back on the transformations which this human soul has gone through. We look back, I need not recapitulate, on the different periods of earth evolution and have on a number of occasions characterized the post-Atlantean era to show how the state of the human soul has always been changing in this post-Atlantean era. It is particularly in speaking of these things that we must move from abstract to concrete thinking. We must try ever more intensively to answer the question, what did things really look like in the human soul in those earlier times? We are looking back on a primal period when we may say so in more than a figurative sense, divine teachers were imparting the sacred secrets of existence to human beings. And we know that from then onward, human beings have found many different ways of learning about those secrets of existence. The ideas formed in the human soul did indeed change again and again through the ages. Ideas we have living in us today and put in words at any moment, also lived in earlier states of soul, but they live there in a very, very different way. Many of our most common concepts were utterly different then. Today I'll refer to two common concepts living in the human soul today. People are at any moment referring to them in words that are part of their vocabulary. They also lived in the human soul in the past, but in a completely different way. I want to speak of the concepts space and time. Space is the most abstract thing people can think of today. They do not have much idea of space today. Three dimensions at right angles to one another, or if one reads textbooks of philosophy, how far physical objects extend. And there are also other definitions of space. But all this Consider how dry, cold, and abstract it all is. Three dimensions at right angles to one another, or indeed everything that is said about space and geometry, dreadfully abstract, dry, and conceptual. So conceptual that in art the whole of space, with time, by the way, has become subjective shadow, merely looking at the sensory phenomena. This abstract concept of space which modern people know very little about except that it has length, width, and height. This abstract notion was a very different thing in the distant past, with some idea still existing today for a few particularly sensitive people, but only a trace of it remains today. 
Yet we do not have to go all that far back to the 6th, 7th, 8th pre-Christian centuries and it will be fair to say at that time space, the way people experienced space was something very different for the human soul and not the dry abstraction which space is for the human soul today. In early Greek times the human soul still knew something when experiencing space which it could connect with which it could feel in a living way. It felt itself to be in something that was alive when it felt itself to be in a space. At most only a trace of this remains for humanity today. A few people have traces of sentience, I'll come to this shortly, of being present in space as a person, as a human being. But the people of those earlier times were saying something by which they meant a significant relationship between them and the universe as they distinguished between above and below, left and right, in front and behind. The living relationship people had with the three dimensions in those times do indeed have terribly little to do with our abstract three dimensions, which really do nothing but be at right angles to one another. Uh, Truly boring if you can do nothing for all eternity but be at right angles to one another, like the three dimensions in geometry. The living experience which people meant in that past, when speaking of above and below, left and right, in front and behind, really has terribly little to do with those three dimensions. Above and below. It was something full of life when people in ancient times were still sentient of how they were first a young child and came upright, from below up, when they felt how life consists in unfolding in the direction from above and below. Life consists in living the direction of the above and below. It is just a short distance which we move away from the ground in normal life as we grow, unless one lives in the Aramonic times of airships or the Atlantean times, though in those times it was not very far above the ground, as you know from my description of Atlantis feeling oneself to be living in the above and in the below, and not just above and below. The contrast between above and below was felt in those early times to be the contrast between the world of conscious awareness and the world of objects, the conscious and the unconscious world. People were deeply sentient of how subject relates to object when they experienced above and below. Above and ever higher and higher above are the worlds of the gods. Below are the worlds that are opposite to the gods. And the human being has his place in the above and below. Even with someone like Goethe, who only you only need to study his Faust, you still find remnants of that awareness of above and below. Humanity was then also sentient of left and right. We have to speak in abstract terms about left and right today. The people of early times genuinely learned something when experiencing left and right, a genuine world of observation. The above and below is the line from infinity to infinity or from conscious to unconscious. Left and right, in experiencing left and right, people felt the connection in the world between meaning and form wisdom and form. Just draw an axis of symmetry. Anything to the right of it and to the left of it will together give you the form, and you cannot connect the one with the other unless you do it meaningfully, relating one to the other. If above and below were pointing to the mysterious relationship which human beings have to the spiritual and material worlds, The experience of left and right is the relationship of human beings to the world as it spreads in the form. They would feel themselves to be in this second element of space as they related left and right to one another, letting wisdom prevail in forms symmetrically arranged in left and right. This experience of meaning in form of wisdom in form, in all possible variations. This feeling oneself within this harmony of meaning and form, wisdom and form, was 
to the human beings of those earlier times what for us today is the abstract second dimension. And the above and below and the left and right come together in something which is the plane, which cannot yet exist in sense-perceptible form, needing thickness, needing in front and behind if it is to exist in the sense-perceptible world. And in this third element, in the in front and behind, the people of old sensed the material making the leap into the spiritual. Above and below, left and right, they would still sense as something spiritual. There can be no physical existence if if something is just above and below, left and right. It is just an image and has to be an image in space. It needs thickness to be material. In those early times, people had a lively awareness that when you grow, you take a few steps up from the ground in the above and below direction. Walking, you can move freely and are in your will element, in front and behind. Between them is the moving in complete freedom to left and right as you stand still. The people of those earlier times were sentient of these three opposite pairs, which in their nature are part of the whole universe. This stay where you are with regard to left and right, this stepping out into the world with regard to in front and behind, this slow upward movement along the above-below axis, Living in the above and below, they were sentient of everything we call the intelligence, the rationality of the universe being active in the whole cosmos. For them, all intelligence, alive in the universe, was interwoven with the above and below. Being able to be involved in this intelligence of the universe, as they grew from below upward, they also felt themselves to be intelligent. Participation in the above and below was to them also participation in cosmic intelligence. Participation in left and right, with meaning and form, wisdom and form interwoven, was to them the feeling which is alive and active throughout the world. Standing quietly, surveying the world, was to them the connection between their own and the world's feeling. And walking through space in the in-front and behind axis was to them the unfolding of the will, taking one's place in the universe, in the world will, with one's own will. They felt their life to be interwoven with above and below, with left and right, with in-front and behind. Conscious and unconscious elements, above and below, wisdom and form, left and right, spirit and matter in front and behind. That was the sentience of those early t- earlier times. At the same time, however, those earlier people vaguely felt, I'm putting it in extreme terms, quote, if one stands on one's head, the below will be up above and the above will be below, close quote. But that is also how it is with the Antipodians. And if one sees oneself as part of the earth, The below is above, the above is below. And so it is also possible to imagine that one day, thanks to something or other, anything which is on the right will be in front, anything on the left will be behind. These directions are just as alive and active in space as they are in a sense indistinguishable, interweaving. In those earlier times when people were aware of living in that threefold space, They felt that the divine, in its threefold form, reigned in space. The divine spirit reigning in space made human beings aware of the divine in eternity. The people of those times experienced, and what I am saying now is something they truly did experience, the divine in space in its revelation, tripartite by nature. It was the image for them of the threefold God, Father, Son, and Spirit, or whatever name the threefold God was given. The Trinity truly is something that was not thought up. It is not an invention. The Trinity, with all its particular characteristics, was experienced in image when people had living experience of tripartite space. 
Lack of clarity may prevail, in a sense, when it comes to above and below, and the way right and left may also turn into in front and behind. Under certain circumstances, lack of clarity may also affect the interrelationship between God, Son, and Spirit. However, when in the sphere of transience, in the sphere of space, people were living with the three dimensions, not in an abstract geometrical way, which is what to do we do, but in concrete living experience of how the divine comes into its own in space, when they were at the same time also aware of transience, they would relate this transience to the element of eternity, and tripartite space became for them the image of the tripartite spirit. Living down here on earth, I am living in the trinity of space. But this trinity of space is an image proof of the trinity, of the divine origin of the world. That was more or less how people thought in the past. Today, space has become abstract, and only a few people are sentient of the depth dimension, the thickness dimension, and the way they arise, above and below, in front, behind, left and right, the dimension of the plane. Even philosophers do not offer much living experience of this. Yet a few individuals who think about things and are not wholly asleep will realize that the depth dimension arises only on unconscious observation which is not that far below conscious awareness. People do still experience seeing the depth, but that is the last shadowy remnant of that living experience of space. In the religions which have developed, true understanding of Trinity was preceded by understanding for the oneness of the God. Understanding for the oneness of the God has much the same origin as understanding for the trinity of the God through space. Spiritual science finds its things from the divine facts themselves. Foolish people will come and say that some external proof or other does not exist. Well, we have told a few things about this and I could tell much more, but we won't spend time on it today. Let me just point out that perhaps it is simply that today's, in quotes, science, is so unscientific that proof cannot be found. Let me tell you just one thing, in a way also as an outward proof that people in past times had the sentience I spoke of today. Why did the rabbis of old also call God space, in quotes? Because, in earlier times, People had the sentience of which I have been speaking also in Judaism. If science meant genuine thought in the different fields, countless riddles would be found. But these are at the same time genuine proof, external proof of what is to be found in spiritual science, though in this case from the spiritual facts. One of the names the rabbis have for God is space. Space and God are one and the same. The oneness of the divine is similar in origin to the trinity of the divine. This is because of living experience of time. For people in earlier times also did not experience time in the abstract way we do today. Concrete living experience of time was lost even earlier than concrete living experience of space. If you read Plato or Aristotle, not the way many a schoolmaster does today. I have on several occasions referred to the note Hebel had made in his diary about a schoolmaster faced with the fact that the reincarnated Plato was at his school, and lo and behold, the schoolmaster was at that time just reading out one of Plato's dialogues in class, and the reincarnated Plato was given really bad marks by the schoolmaster. This is what Hebel wrote in his diary. So if you read Plato and Aristotle with real deeper understanding, you will, per you will everywhere, in their works, read how people really still had a good feeling for this in pre-Christian times, in the 6th, 7th and 8th centuries before Christ. It had faded to some extent by the time of Plato and Aristotle, 
but one can still clearly sense this getting a feel for space of which I spoke. The living experience of time was lost even earlier, however. It was very much alive in the second post-Atlantean era, the ancient Persian age. Zarathustra's disciples would have felt a shudder, of course, if one had said to them that time goes in a line which runs evenly from past to future. In the Gnosis, in the time of Gnosis, people still had a shadow of the feeling, scarcely recognizable, however, that time was a living thing. People would not say that there was such a line going from past to future. They would speak of eons, of the creators who had been there in the past, with the later ones coming forth from them, with one eon always handing on the creation impulses to the other. The image they would have of time was more or less that in the succession of hierarchies, the spirit who went before would always hand on the impulses to those who came next, with the next always brought forth, as it were, by the preceding one. The preceding one would encompass the one that followed. People would look up to the one who had gone before as being more divine than the one which followed. In quotes, later was felt to be ungodly. In quotes, earlier, more divine. Living experience of and learning about time included looking at the change with the development going from divine to godless everything would fall apart if the godly and ungodly were not to interweave and be a whole, and that is identical with our present-day abstract notions of past and future. But in the image of time, looking back and embracing more and more comprehensive elements until one comes to the ancient of days, people were sentient of the image of the God who was one. The old experience of time provided the basis for monotheism. The old experience of space provided the basis for the Trinity. That is how the state of the human soul has changed. Something that was full of life has grown abstract and dry. Paradoxical though it may sound, modern man is undoubtedly thinking of something abstract when speaking of space, and, I think, he thinks of a living relationship when speaking of a friend. But that concreteness, that elementary living experience which speaks from friend to friend today, to give an example, is still abstract compared to the intense experience of the world which people had in earlier times, living with space and time which were images to them of the one God and the Trinity. So we have grown dry and abstract when it comes to space and time. And something else must take their place, something of which we must have living experience, making it part of our inner life. We must learn to be sentient of the dualism, the contrast in the world of which I spoke last week. Just think of someone seeing only the ruffled surface of water. Essentially, it is an abstract line. What is concrete here? Water down there, air above it. And in the interaction of the two, of their forces, we get the maya, the ruffled surface. That is how we are as human beings as we look at ourselves within maya. If we look at ourselves in a real way, we must also see ourselves right here, water below, air up above. Water below, we see it as we observe transient development as I presented it here last week. The human being develops so that ideas he may have as a child would only be understood in old age. The ideas he has at sexual maturity he will understand a bit earlier, but still only when old age is approaching, and so on. As I presented a human life where it is only in old age that one is able to grasp what one has been in childhood and youth. Life proceeds like this, not seemingly but in reality on the surface. I told you that perhaps one does not need such an overview, even today, in order to live, but one does need it in order to die. That is the idea of the lower, the idea of the true upper principle, the region of eternity of which I spoke last week, goes with it. 
There the human being does not develop, but also has the principle that belongs to the region of eternity all his life, from birth to death. But today we are unable to consider how the lower and the upper interweave unless we grasp the lower at the point where it threatens to grow rigid, where it threatens to harden. If we then grasp the upper where it threatens to evaporate, to grow spiritual, unless we grow sentient of the opposite nature, divine, luciferic, aramonic. In earlier times people had something that was alive in their souls, as they spoke of their experience of space, their experience of time. In future, human beings will have to develop inner concepts, inner idea impulses, divine, aramani, luciferic. The end of Lecture 7